this is the definition by the NCCPE, the National Coordinating Center for Public Engagement in the UK. Um, they say public engagement describes the myriad of ways in which the activity and benefits of higher education and research can be shared with the public. Engagement is by definition a two-way process involving interaction and listening with the goal of gener generating mutual benefit. So here we have one possible uh, definition, the one of the NCCPE, and the thing we, we might want to, to keep from this definition is, first of all, the myriad of ways. There is, and we'll see this in the upcoming examples, a myriad of ways to do public engagements. And, and I, there is no bad way or better way, but they have various impacts. They also will involve you in various different ways, and it will be up to you to find yours. Uh, but there is obviously at least one, if not several, types of public engagement for you. The other thing is that, as you've outlined yourself, it's a two-way process, which means uh, it, this is a, a space in public engagement. It's a process where you will not be here only to explain things, but also to listen to others, to have some feedback, to realize something about your research, maybe, or how we, or about how it is perceived. But don't expect in public engagement to be just disseminating your results. Uh, it's going to be a real meeting with, with a, a new stakeholder um, in, involving interaction and listening and generating mutual benefits. We'll come this a bit later. We will not in this training tackle all the benefits for your research uh, of public engagement because I think this is tackled by the master by the other um, uh, master classes you ha you're having. Uh, with Excite, where you can also see some, some much more detailed analysis of, uh, of the various impacts on researchers of public engagement. In the same, so this is from the website of the NCCP. On the same website, they mention a few practices and, and names that you've already mentioned here on the board before, such as patient involvement, where, especially in health research, we're going to involve patients in the research, so they will also give ideas, give their views. Um, and, and think about the ongoing research and influence the ongoing research, outreach, as you've said, community engagement, where you will work with a specific community, collaborative research, where you will actually really do the research and, and produce knowledge with uh, some citizens, lifelong learning, participatory arts, where you can use the arts also uh, to, to as, as a means for engagement or citizen science. But let's have a few examples. First of all, here you can see the first question we may ask ourselves is when we do public engagement, who should do the public engagement? Should it be the researcher or facilitator? In whatever action you will do, both are always possible. It's always possible to go yourself speaking with the audience uh, and, and doing the thing yourself. Or if you have to interact with the audience, you may ask a professional to do it. And uh, you can also have both at the same time. So in the upper left part of the screen, you can see uh, from University of Bristol, this is from the three minute thesis, um, uh, the, the, the scheme where researchers share their research and, and explain what it is in only three minutes. So this is a very simple process where a researcher come and say in three minutes, my research is about this. This is why it's so important and interesting and try to be engaging with it. On the right side, what you can see is, once again, me a long time ago as a facilitator, or as a demonstrator here. And here I'm not as a researcher. So I can do things from my own skills as a demonstrator, like being held by the audience. You have, I asked some people in the audience to come and hold me in the air so I could throw this bottle up. I, I know ways to engage the, the audience, which is great that researchers don't know. But there is something I don't have when I'm here on the right. I am not a researcher myself, which means I cannot say, this is what my research is about. This is what I'm crying at night about because my results are not the right one I was expecting. This is what excites me in the morning when I go to work. This is the very late re last results I just got from my lab, or this is something that's been blocking me for month and month. I cannot share what is the real research process and what is the real uh, daily research life in a lab. I can tell about it, I can story tell about it, but it will be something very different than an experience as having a real researcher 
meeting and discussing so that we, we can understand what their life is and what their how research also changed their perception of the world. Uh, on the in, in the bottom part uh, on the left, you can see lots of students. And here I was leading a workshop with the researchers, meaning we had both in the room, the researchers and myself, which means that I was leading the workshop with students, but researchers were also present to discuss with the students and present their research. And that was a nice way to have both advantages, like a format that is very well defined, but also some direct contact between researchers and, uh, and people and audiences. Now it's time to, to tackle something that is uh, impossible to, to avoid when we speak about public engagement, which is deficit versus dialogue. Have you ever heard about this deficit versus dialogue paradigm? You can write, write yes or no in the chat of the Zoom call. No, not much. All right. It's, um, it's a very classical paradigm for public engagement professionals. Uh, so dozens of years ago, the deficit model of science communication was built, which was the idea that if people did maybe did not, uh, were, were not so as interested as science as we thought they should be, or were not accepting everything as we thought they should be, that was probably because they were not knowledgeable enough. And that's because they just didn't know science enough. So we had plenty of activities to teach, explain science, uh, have people understand science, discover science, and we did a lot of this. But, and that was in, in the 1990s, we had a lot of activities this way, but quite soon we realized that this was actually, from studies, we saw that it was not fully efficient and that very often people were having sometimes some um, opposition to scientific fields or to, science, to so some science questions, not because they didn't know enough, they knew a lot, or if you give, gave them knowledge, they were happy to have knowledge, but they were not more engaged for, for this. What they needed is a space to dialogue, a space where they could speak up, where they could think and share, not just listen and be told. And many dialogue even started to uh, rise up, like the science cafes, where you go in a cafe and you meet a scientist, and the scientist will tell you about their research, and you will, of course, be able to ask questions and discuss with the scientists. And on your right here, you have a picture from another European project, which was called Sparks, and that led uh, reverse science cafes, meaning that here you have a scientist, but the scientist will speak very little, will introduce their research, and actually the conversation will be really be led by the audiences uh, who will think, who will give, give their, their views and, and ask the scientist questions, but the, the scientist will have less time to present their research and more time to react to the views, questions, and, and uh, elements presented by the, the rest, by the non-academic in the room, in the cafe. And in the, so in the upper part, you have an example of the Royal Institution, which is a wonderful example of a classic uh, deficit model action, where we have a wonderful conference from a great presenter showing us their great results of science. And this is wonderful. Please do not uh, do not think that deficit actions, uh, deficit model actions are always bad at all. There are some wonderful ones and they are part of the landscape of public engagement. And here we have the royal lectures uh, from the, the royal institutions, which are uh, a, a huge, huge institution here in the UK, uh, great quality conferences. But you have the opposite on, uh, on the left side uh, in the down part, where you can see some young people discussing together. And here there is no scientist. There is no researcher, there, no one is giving them the knowledge. The little, little bit of knowledge they have, very tiny bits, are actually on the green cards and the blue cards that you see on the table. These young people have little cards, it's a game called Play Decide, and some of these cards con contain some, a few science facts, but just a few tiny bits. Some others contain some questions, more open, complicated questions or controversial questions, um, and some others will tell will be story cards where you will see a character telling you, I am an activist in that field and I think that, or I am a, a mother of two children and I think this. And using those cards, uh, th these young people are going to start to reflect and debate. And they will debate 
on a topic that can be about genetic disease, it can be um, about a wide range of topics, very often health related because there are lots of controversial topics or at least good topics for debate there uh, on neuroscience. So you can, if you go on the Play Decide website, you'll see a huge wealth of Play Decide games that have been designed by science professionals or science engagement professionals. You can also design yours yourself if you'd like. You have all the necessary tools there. Uh, it's a quite long game, this, this one. It takes more than one hour, but you have some much shorter ones as well, which aim not to give a lot of content, but to give very little content and have people with that little content start debating, start reflecting, and most of all, start confronting to the other's opinions and seeing, can they do, have a consensus? Can they build some kinds of consensus somewhere? So it's also very much a critical thinking exercise. Another question you may ask yourself when you do public engagement is, what role do I want uh, the audience members to have? The publics, as we say, although pu publics are, are, are a very diverse crowd, uh, what role do I want for them? from them? Do I want them to be spectator? Do I want them to be actor? And when I say actor, how much involvement will they have? Um, a very simple involvement is given on the picture on the, uh, on, on the left, which is from Science Gallery Dublin. And this is from their, um, from their exhibition, which was called Tra Trauma. Science Gallery Dublin just closed, unfortunately, but you have other science galleries in the world now. It was the first one, the, the one in Dublin. And they had this uh, beautiful exhibitions uh, on mixing art and science, always on a very interdisciplinary topic like love or happiness or trauma. And here, on this one on trauma was also a lot of, about memory, of course. And the picture you can see is a kind of closet, which is uh, for laundering memories. So when you arrive in the exhibition, you would um, have a little sheet of paper given to you, and you would write two memories on this sheet of paper, a good one and a bad one. And the facilitator in front of you would take this piece of paper, will put it in one of the drawers, close the drawer with a lock and a key, give you the key so you're sure no one can open it when, while you are not here, and you will go visit the exhibition. And at the end of the exhibition, you will give back the key, we will open the drawer, and we will give you back your paper. But meanwhile, something will have changed. What will have changed is that this little paper with your memories would have been slightly amended by facilitators, meaning that it now state not the original memory you have written, but it will state now the, me the memories modified by time. And for this, the Science Gallery team will use the current research on memories, showing how with time our mind is changing memories, removing pieces of information, adding some pieces of information, changing some, and they will use this to show you how a memory is affected over time and how it changes. And so this is a very simple activity, but through this, there is something a little bit more involving than a lecture in this process, which is the audience give their own memory here. You do not tell them what is amended usually in memories. Everyone can see their own memories being actually changed and working with your own elements of your own life is a super efficient and involving element in public engagement. So this is of course a question from you, for you, all of you. Are there ways in which your research can relate to uh, uh, the personal life of someone and where they can actually find a link and be more involved. On the right side, you can see another uh, participatory process. Uh, where if you see the big panel, what controls our perception of time and can we slow it down? This is not from Dublin, this is from Bristol, from We the Curious Science Center in Bristol, which completely ch changed its ground floor. And instead of dividing the sections of the main exhibition by disciplines, for example, physics, biology, or by topics, what it did was gather questions from the citizens of Bristol. So in the street, in the science center, in Bristol schools, uh, as much as possible everywhere, they gathered, uh, I think, 10,000 questions uh, from the city, and they then tried to curate the questions, used also a youth board to curate uh, the questions with them. And those questions defined the, the, the main sections of the science centers. And they tried to use very interdisciplinary questions like, is there another me in the universe? 
So there is one part of the museum where it's written, is there another me in the universe? And you'll think about this question from, um, uh, of course, a genetic perspective, but also from um, an, a cosmology perspective. Is there another universe similar to ours somewhere? Or from this, different disciplines? In, in, for, to the, for the question, can I become invisible? It will be tackled through optics, but it will also tackled through social sciences. And what is social invisibility? And you will have an association speaking about homeless people and, and how you can become socially invisible, things like this. So fr drawing from pe people's question, you can build quite a rich and engaging frame as well. And in the, in the downside part, you can see some people prototyping. And this is part of the Turfu Festival uh, which use the living lab methodology where people are designing their own ideas, building their own ideas, testing their own prototypes. So uh, this is a methodology where the audience is actually the main lead and we are supporting them to build their own projects uh, and to be part of a research process or an innovation process as really co-lead of what's happening. Now, the, the questions that some of you had in the survey is, in real life or online? All the examples I've, done, I've given so far were in real life. But of course, you can engage a lot online. And the first project I wanted to present to you is a very old project. It's from 2008. So I don't know if you remember 2008. I'm not sure you already had to, Twitter existed, but at that time, uh, you, you probably didn't have Twitter yet, your Twitter account yet. Facebook did exist, but didn't make much money. At, uh, wasn't uh, the first cash flow, positive cash flow of Facebook is 2009. So it's really the very beginning of social media. Um, so 2008, we have uh, this team at the University of Nottingham, uh, especially the, more, the most hairy one, who is uh, Professor Polyakov, who decided to have this periodic table of videos. And they make this very low cost the very local website, which is honestly not pretty at all. It's gray. You can see a periodic table of elements. It's not very engaging in itself, but they make it anyway. And they decide to make in one month, one video for each element. So a short video, uh, very homemade, not really, not beautiful at all, uh, telling about hy hydrogen, telling about helium, telling about lithium. So, and for every element you click on, you will have a YouTube video on it. So. It was done very, very quickly. It was not very costly. And um, it had a quite a huge success. And they were quite clever in the way to build on that success. And today, it's, it, it has, um, I think, 50,000 50, sorry, 50 million views on YouTube, uh, their videos. Uh, they have um, something like 350,000 followers uh, so for their channel. So it's a, it's a huge success. And for me, the lessons that this tells us is that for online engagement, the great thing is you can start really low. You can, you can do your video even if it's not good. If the first one is bad, it's okay. You can start engaging not at a very strong level and you can start testing formats, testing some ideas. And from all the discussion I've had with people who engage online on social media, the recurring phrase is, we never know what will go viral we'll never know what will go viral. And sometimes it's something completely unexpected. So the only way to know is to produce. And strangely enough, on, on online, especially on social media, um, many people who are successful are focusing on quantity rather than quality, which is quite shocking for me. As a professional, I try to have always the best quality ever. And, and meeting people who said, no, I make a lot of videos. Some, not all of them are good, but it's okay. But I make a lot of them, that's the most important thing has been quite, quite a shock. But it's, the, the interesting thing is that it means you can start really small. You don't have to design your whole thing, have a beautiful image, a wonderful website. You can quickly start engaging here. Uh, on, the, on, on, on the lower part, you can see a satellite on the left, which is done by Tinkercad. And, and the, it's linked also with the small YouTube videos on the, from the Abbas Foundation that you can see uh, close to it. And this is part of a, a work I'm doing with the Abbas Foundation. Um, where we, at some point we offered people to watch short videos, 90 seconds long videos, and do some activities on Tinkercad, which is, the, which is a 3D design, uh, but very simple 3D design. It can be done by, a, by an eight-year-old child, uh, where you will react to the video by building your own satellite or your own rocket, your own 
uh, moon rover or whatever uh, to 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 respond to the video but if you now look on the right you have a few examples on social media and i voluntarily didn't choose facebook or twitter but i looked for a bit more recent ones so on the upper part you can see uh microbiology which is a uh, the, the, the Instagram account of uh, Dr. Heinz, and uh, Heinz shares uh, his research. You can see here beautiful photos of what he's doing. You can, he shares also uh, stories about how the research is going and what he's doing daily on his research. He has a, a huge number of followers, I think uh, 144,000 followers. Uh, and that's, that can be a very simple and nice way to share your research online. If uh, Instagram is actually quite quite efficient here on TikTok, we don't have yet many researchers on TikTok, uh, but we have a few ones. I I did uh, put you uh, here, uh, Rachel Brenner, who is sharing a lot on on TikTok. So TikTok is is strange because it's a lot for entertainment. On TikTok, people don't go there to find content or to find um, very deep content or documentation. Usually, they go there to entertain themselves with funny videos. And on, on this uh, channel, so Rachel Brenner does some TikTok videos, meaning they are funny videos telling about her life as a PhD researcher, then her life as a researcher after her PhD, the questions she has. And she actually ha has quite a lot of followers as well. It works very well. And I don't think, really don't think all of them are, are PhD researchers or, or from the academia, even though obviously a part of them are. And this, is it was interesting to me also because usually I, I used in the past to focus a lot on the content when I would engage online. And here we can see on TikTok people engaging in a very shallow way with the content and sharing much more their personal life as a researcher and really intertwining their life as a researcher with the content to share. And I think that's that's one of the big strengths of public engagement where you can you, uh, yourself tell not just about the topic you're studying or researching, but about uh, who you are, what's your life, what makes you, your day miserable today, what makes your day wonderful today. And you, and you can have fun with this and engage people with a mixed thing which where there will be some parts, some, some elements of content and some elements of other things that will make, uh, that will make the content a bit more human. So it, it can be an interesting um, I mean, I mean as well. You know, the question you another question you'll ask yourself if you are uh, if you are doing public engagement is where will I do it? We have seen online space, but even in in real life space, should I go in a science center? You all probably have science centers in your cities or in your regions. Um, do will do will I do it in a science festival? And you have great science festivals all over Europe, or will I go where people are, where people who don't go to science festival? People, and that's the virtue of, of something like going on TikTok as well, is you reach people who would never go in a science engagement event or platform. Uh, for example, uh, you have the Leaf Lab photos here, and this photo is uh, on the uh, upper left, and this photo is in Scotland. It's a shopping mall, and we, it's a program of uh, scientists in residency in a shopping mall. So people who go shopping with their families who would maybe never go to a science-related event, just come here and wonder what's happening. And they chat with a scientist doing their research, they chat with some facilitators uh, and, and do a few activities and you can reach a whole different audience. On the lower part, uh, you can see Bristol Ferry on the t-shirt uh, of the lady that's here. And she's actually making a pompon and that's part of Fun Palaces, so a, a great campaign uh, for art and science activities that is community led all over the UK and now even beyond. And here, uh, the, as, an, as an activity related to health, we had the people in the Bristol Ferry uh, actually make pompons, stick some little health advice uh, uh, labels on the pompons, write a health advice on the, the label and decorate the boat with the pompons. So the ferry boat was all decorated. And this is a small ferry boat that goes all day long back and forth in Bristol. And that means that actually transportation time of people is a time that often they don't know what to do with. So it's a great time to engage with them if they want to. Um, and it's also a great space to reach people once again. 
that may discover that they're fascinated by your, by your research, but would never, never, never come to you in a space that is research, research labeled. So you can come to them here and you have something similar on the right, which is also part of Penn Palaces. This is the train in Bristol that goes from uh, in, in various cities and, and many people use it to commute in the morning and in the evening. And during that commute time, we had here a drawer drawing pictures of people and you can build an engagement activity uh, as well in, in the train, in the subway. So you have to find the right activities for the right uh, element, but, but you can really use those spaces. All right, uh, as a last, very last slide, and then we'll do a, a couple of minutes uh, break. What will you engage people with if you do public engagement? With your research results or with your resource, research process? So very classical thing, you can engage with your research results and that's wonderful. For example, in the upper left, you can see a board game. Uh, that's part of an activity that was led by Malvin Artaud in France. And they, they built with researchers a board game uh, to understand uh, how we can have a better uh, energy mix of various energy sources for ecological reasons, but that would be still acceptable for economical reasons. So they made a board game out of this. And we, they, they even had some students test it, give feedback, transform the game. And that's great. That's built on the research results from that group of researchers. But if you go to the Instagram account on the lower part of uh, Pond Life, Pond Life, uh, here Sally Waring is sharing what her daily life as a researcher is. So she's not sharing so much about uh, the great result, but she's sharing what she's doing daily, uh, how she is uh, taking some samples, analyzing them, what is her daily life as a researcher. And if you go to the, and she, uh, not only the daily life, what is her re the research process? How is she analyzing things? How is she comparing the results? And on the right, you have this little colorful box and these post-its. And this is an activity from the Science Museum in London. And the goal of this activity is to the mystery boxes is to uh, understand what the research process is in general. And you have these nice boxes with numbers and each of them has something different inside. And what you have to do is to discover what's inside. So you have usually a group of children and they will try to discover what's inside. They cannot open the box because the box are sealed. So they will very often shake the box and listen to it. They will weigh the box. They will use plenty of different tools to analyze what could be inside the box. So we'll make some hypothesis. So oh, I think it's sand, or maybe I think it's a little marble inside. And yeah, but how, how heavy is it? Is it a marble? Is it the same weight as a marble? They will start questioning themselves and they will not open the box because the box are sealed. So they will just make these hypotheses, discuss together, uh, present to the others their conclusions, have their conclusion contested by the others because the others would say, wait, if you say this, then maybe it's a different conclusion you should be, you should be having. So what they will go through is actually a peer reviewed process in between children. And they will discover all the skills, also the social skills and the, the variety of skills you need to do science, which is not just doing math or using a microscope, but also going through all this social process of peer reviewed research. And at the very end, of the activity, the most cruel thing, and in my view, the most beautiful thing, is that when the activity is over, you cannot open the box because the box are sealed. So no one knows the truth. No one knows what's inside the box. What we only know is what is our best hypothesis? What is our, the, the most, the only results where, where we have a kind of consensus between researchers but we never had anything where we say, okay, we opened the box, we know the truth, it's over. It's never totally over because we're always at risk that someone else might say, wait, I have a new experiment that may change the result. So it's a nice way to engage with uh, what the research process is. And once again, if you design your future public engagement action, you may try to engage on your life as a researcher, on the results of your research, or you may try to engage on how do I build knowledge? How do I go on and anal analyze things? How do I analyze things as an individual? And how do, I, do we analyze things as a research community? And how do we build knowledge? Just before I leave you, I would like to first thank you, but also 
leave you with a few questions. And these are questions for you to reflect during the week, the upcoming week. So in which way could your research connect with people? Your research might be very close to people's life or very far away, but there are ways, there are metaphors, there are, they, they will, they are obviously ways. That's some questions that public engagement associate would tell you to support you. So in which way would you connect with people? How much will you need to tell your research or could you trigger a dialogue rather than telling the, uh, the, the audience? What kind of involvement the public could have? How strong, how much of an actor, how involved in your research? Would you be more comfortable in real life or would you be happy to try online or even go on social media and start dialogue maybe on Twitter? And what kind of spaces would you, could you use? What, are, are there some science centers or some museums around you, some NGOs working in public engagement in science that could help you? Or maybe could you go and partner with a nursery, with a shopping mall or with a transportation in the city? So I leave this up to you. These are questions for you to reflect, to go on with your future project of public engagement. Mm -hmm.